Hello, welcome back to Talking Europe with me, Catherine Nicholson. Now, the EU is just now coming to the end of a big experiment in public debate. It's called the Conference on the Future of Europe, an eight month long event in which the EU invited its 450 million citizens to share their thoughts on how the bloc might reorient itself to face new challenges. Now, if you watched part one of Talking Europe just now, you'll have seen our report following four of the young Europeans who've been taking part in the conference. If you missed that, it is available on our website under Talking Europe. With me right now are three people who did see the report and who took part in the conference itself in different ways. We'll be asking what, if anything, the conference has achieved and whether true change will come about. In the studio with me here at the European Parliament in Strasbourg are Alexandrina Naimovic, who's Secretary General of the European Civic Forum and co-president of the Civil Society Convention on the Future of Europe. Hello, thanks for being with us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Also, there's two members of the European Parliament uh, on my right uh, from Italy, Brando Benife, uh, an MEP from the Socialists and Democrats group, and next to him, Hungarian MEP Katalin Cze, who's vice chair of Renew. Hello to both of you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. OK, well, let's get started then. I'd like to first uh, ask you about your takeaway from the conference on the future of Europe. Perhaps coming to you first, Alexandrina, as a representative of uh, regular civilians. Um, what do you think? Did this encourage useful debate? Did good ideas come out of it? Did you feel listened to? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, certainly we had some uh, minutes to talk uh, in plenary and uh, in working groups. And as uh, part of organized civil society in Europe, it's true that we do have also other channels to interact with the European institutions and this is also what, what we do uh, on a regular basis. But it's true that the conference, we look at it also as a great opportunity to reconnect politics with the grassroots in a way and to hear and to listen to what citizens have to say, what are their concerns, what are their hopes, what are their expectations. So indeed I think that this is a great momentum also because we are facing major, major challenges in Europe. And it's not only the health uh, challenge and now uh, the, the sanitary crisis that uh, puts mm. us in difficulty, but this also reveals some structural uh, problems that we have in our societies. And citizens more and more tend also to let's say, lose trust in the capacity of our institutions, not only at mm. the European level, of course, at the national and even local level, to respond to their needs and expectations. So I think it's a very timely exercise. And as civil society organizations, it's true that we were a little bit frustrated that there was no particular channel for uh, organized citizens, so to say, to participate and to be heard. But anyway, I hope that there will be a chance to, to make our voice heard. And in any case, we look and work into uh, thematic working groups. Probably there will be time to introduce a little bit the Convention of Civil Society. Indeed. Um, well, you mentioned trust there. Uh, the European Union does its own survey of the public uh, every quarter. And in the latest one, uh, slightly more EU citizens said that they don't trust the EU than trust it. Uh, although trust in the EU is up as a whole, but it's not the majority point of view. So I'll put that to our two members of the European Parliament. Um, Ketalin Che, I'll come to you first, because I know that you tweeted very enthusiastically about this conference when it was being launched. You said it, it was going to embrace democratic innovation, unleash ideas. Uh, has it happened? Well, I believe this is an amazing democratic exercise and I'm very, very proud uh, for the Union to undertaking it. And I'm glad that my group, Renew Europe, pushed for this conference from the very beginning. Uh, ever too often, politicians try to decide what is good for people over their heads. And we believe that this is not the right way to approach things, uh, particularly uh, such major reforms that are necessary in the Union. Uh, we need to move forward together because right now, I believe Europe is stuck. We need to undertake very major reforms, very serious reconsiderations about our place in the world, uh, our state of democracy, uh, our decision-making mechanisms, how to be stronger, more effective, uh, more assertive on the global stage, how to provide better future for our children. But for this, the reforms uh, that are needed are, are very deep and very meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad uh, to uh, be part of this uh, common thinking together with civil society, with national parliaments, with citizens. Mm -hmm. And I'm active in the values group. And I have to say, 
it is such a delight to hear so many inspiring ideas and ambition from the Did citizens. Did you hear things that you weren't expecting to hear from the citizens? You know, I'm from Hungary and uh, my government very often uh, says things like, yes, citizens don't want European values and, and that. I never believed that really, uh, but uh, this convention so far uh, was such a refreshing way to give me back trust how much European citizens really believe on the foundations of democracy, uh, how much they really expect uh, the Union to be a safeguard of human rights. Uh, this is such a good uh, way forward to the future and I really hope that us politicians eventually uh, be able to live up to the expectations and really undertake those reforms the citizens are asking for us. Okay, so lots of uh, positivity, uh, you've heard lots of ideas. Brando Benife, you're a member of the group that was working on European democracy issues with a, a panel of citizens. Um, do you see actual concrete change coming out of the ideas that you heard? Were the, were the citizens putting forward issues where the European Union can make a difference because of course there is that split between what the EU as a bloc can do and what their national governments can do. Well the skeptics of this uh, exercise of the conference has said at the beginning that we need to be careful not to forget to listen to the citizens. Now there was a, a, a process of listening with the panels, with the online platform, the interaction with uh, organized civil society. And I have to say that the recommendations that came were very ambitious. Now I really say, let's listen to these citizens because they are asking also on democracy to radically change how democracy works in the European Union, to overcome veto powers, to uh, decide to uh, have uh, permanent citizens conventions, to have mm. even pan-European referendums on important issues. And they ask for the Council of the States, of the governments, to become a Senate of the Union. So they want a real democratic system that is more accountable, more transparent and more understandable. Sometimes how the European Union simply is not understood. So mm -hmm. to obtain results on these very ambitious issues that were about the democratic architecture, we cannot end up with the conven the, this conference sorry, with a piece of paper of good intentions. We want a process to start, so a convention to change treaties and to r bring again the citizens to put forward some real change. Think of the foreign policy that it's at the uh, heart of discussion in these moments of uh, discussions on war, on Ukraine, on Russia. Uh, we want a Europe with one voice. This is what citizens are saying. Mm. And so we need to uh, continue a process of change. The conference cannot end up with just good intentions. Mm. It needs to create a process of real reforms. This is what the citizens are asking for. They are saying it clearly now. No one can stop this to happen. Well, it's interesting you, you're saying about uh, the conference continuing on because obviously it's a, it's a single exercise at this point. Alexandrina, if I come back to you, um, it was just eight months long. 800 citizens taking part in the plenary sessions at least. But in total, um, only around half a million people took part in citizens' events that happened around the European Union. You said you regret that there wasn't more place for organisations representing citizens. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, are MEPs quite pleased with uh, this participation? But is it really broad enough out of a block of 450 million people? And I'm sure a lot of our viewers haven't really heard of this conference. Well, I think it's never enough, but I think it's a good start. Uh, the, the issue is that um, we need now this kind of exercise to be repeated. We cannot simply only listen to, to citizens every once in a while. So among the recommendations, obviously, there was one to have some kind of permanent citizens assemblies. What I wanted to say is that um, it's the enthusiasm that we saw in, uh, in the recording of the four people that participated in the panel. Well, this kind of enthusiasm we could see in millions of citizens across Europe that join forces in organizations that work every day to build solidarity, to help those in need, sometimes even to fill some holes that are left by public policies. Mm -hmm. These people, they form organizations, citizens associations, movements, 
charities, etc. And their participation in policy making on a really regular basis would be very beneficial for, uh, for the European Union, simply because they are in contact with people every day. They mm. need, they, they know what are the needs and they can alert the European institutions also on the shortcomings mm. of the European policies. Because it's true that the EU is a strong economic actor, but it's such a paradox that in the biggest the strongest and the richest continent in the world still we have a quarter of the population who lives in poverty or risks mm -hmm. being excluded from our societies and these people we wonder if they really feel included in in the european building processes we would really need to listen to those citizens to include them in the discussion and to provide policies that address their needs Okay, so Zaza, you all want this to carry on and happen again, go further. Uh, Catalin Chi, if I come back to you, uh, Brando Benife was talking about the possibility of changing European treaties, uh, changing the functioning of, of the European Union. Um, the late David Sassoli, the former president of the European Parliament, he, he said that at the launch of the conference as well. He said that we, we must be courageous and not be afraid of changing treaties if the citizens want this. However, the European Parliament majoritarily may be behind this, uh, a lot of citizens' organisations as well, but there are other institutions in the European Union, the European Commission, and also perhaps more crucially, the Council, the Prime Ministers and Presidents of the 27 Member States, who have not been so keen to make big fundamental changes, for example, on, on foreign policy, as Prando Benife mentioned. Can this conference get through that glass ceiling? Well, I believe that uh, if the heads of state uh, and government really take it seriously that uh, this is not a listening exercise, that is not only to listen to the opinions of people, but actually you know, take home something from it, that actually I think, yes, it can happen. Uh, I was glad to see so much ambition uh, really in these citizens' panels. Very often more ambition than I see at a uh, general council meeting or around it or in the commission. Uh, I think the parliament is brave. I think there are European leaders who are brave, uh, but uh, we need to move forward as a community. Uh, if we do not undertake reforms such as uh, getting rid of unanimity in foreign policy, we'll have zero say about what happens in the world, what happens in our neighborhood. It just makes us weak. And we need to listen to the citizens if they say so. Uh, and uh, if there is a strong demand that we have to serve our citizens. Mm -hmm. And Brando Benife, do you believe that this conference in and of itself is something that will add pressure onto those heads of state and government? Because, of course, a lot of them are looking at their own electoral timetables. You know, we have different national elections happening all the time and different national priorities. Europe doesn't necessarily come into those national campaigns. Yeah, it's, it, that's the point. And uh, we need to overcome this short-termism in the views of the uh, successive electoral cycles that block the ambition to actually look a bit further and build the European Union that we need to simply fulfill the requests the citizens are putting on the table also on the other topics on uh, social issues on environment on um, the future of uh, uh, culture and education the conference also discussed about this and we uh, need to be ambitious and if uh, we see pressure coming from the conference, from citizens. In this exercise where you have people representing organizations, people that are simple citizens, not representing anyone else, and people elected to national and European parliaments to put their strong pressure together on the governments of the national states and to the commission, which is sometimes trying to be an arbiter. Why I want the commission to take some courage now, because it's time that we really change Europe. Otherwise, we will be trampled by history, by what is happening around us. So I, I'm convinced that we need to make it evident that there is a conflict between conservatives on this and those that want to progress and to reform. I'm just wondering uh, what the danger is that you see. Is it Euroscepticism? Is that, is that one of the dangers that you to be frank, in, the com in this conference, we have seen a breaking of these categories. We have been discussing with some colleagues about this, in the sense that the citizens will, don't want to be categorized with being uh, uh, Euro-moderates, Euro-reformists, Euro-skeptics. They just say what they want, and we find out that in the end they just want many of them, a real great majority. Mm -hmm. They want a stronger Europe, 
able to deliver on their needs and not divided, not slow, not incomprehensible, the union of today. They want a different union. Just a very brief question, if I may, to Alexandrina. Um, I imagine, from my point of view, that a lot of the citizens who took part in this conference were people who are already interested in Europe. How does the conference reach out to people who are, you know, not paying as much attention? Is that something that you think should happen? Well, I hope it happened through the selection of the citizens that participate in the panels. Uh, we were a little bit critical of the process because we felt that there was not enough um, criteria to make sure that uh, they would represent really the whole diversity of the citizens of Europe, including in terms of uh, race, you know, in terms of uh, social backgrounds. And the risk that we saw at the very beginning of the process is that is, is also a reality that we see all the time on the ground, is that people that feel excluded from the society, people that are at the margins, that they are vulnerable, well, they are away from these kind of processes. Of course, this is also the role of our organizations to, mm. to voice their concerns and to amplify their voices. So. We, we are here also to, to do that. A consideration for the future, I suppose, if what seems to be your collective wish of this conference being repeated does happen. That is all we have time for, but thank you all so much for taking part in this discussion uh, about the conference on the future of Europe. Thank you. Thanks to you for watching as well. Like I said, you can go and find that report on our website, france24.com. Otherwise, see you soon here on Talking Europe.